So at this time, I'd like to introduce Jared Schaefer. Jared is with the Ohio Department of Agriculture in the Plant Health section, and he works with the Field Watch and the Ohio Sensitive Crop Registry. So we'll go ahead and turn it over to Jared. Thanks, Cindy. It's about the uh, third or fourth time I've heard Aaron's inversion presentation, so I think I'm getting pretty good at it now. I'll be an expert here before too long. Um, as Cindy said, my name is Jared Schaefer. I'm an inspector uh, here at the Department of Agriculture in the Plant Health Division. And for the past four years or so, I've been managing, uh, acting as a data steward for the Ohio Sensitive Crop Registry uh, that we've uh, been operating here in the state. Uh, I've been doing outreach uh, to pesticide applicators such as yourselves, uh, beekeepers, specialty crop producers to raise awareness about this system and some potential benefits of it and uh, hopefully reducing the risk of pesticide drift, uh, unintentional pesticide damage um, to sensitive areas, high risk areas that may be nearby your application area. We've had this program for a few years now, but we just recently made a pretty big change. We switched over the software uh, that we've been using, so it may be a little bit different if you've heard of this before. Uh, it may look a little bit different than, than what you've seen previously. Uh, so, uh, you know, first of all, the registry program is an online tool. It's a communications tool, uh, which we provide for beekeepers, for specialty crop producers, and pesticide applicators uh, to use the producers and beekeepers go to the website, they map out their locations where their beehives are, where these sensitive uh, crop areas are, where their fields are. And then the pesticide applicators can go to the website, see where these locations are, see how far away they are from their planned application area, um, do any notifications if required, uh, do buffering, you know, uh, to make sure that drift doesn't occur into these uh, high-risk areas. An important thing to note is that the registry is uh, completely voluntary uh, at this time, and you know, it's not required for producers or beekeepers, um, applicators sort of, uh, to use it. So some folks have privacy concerns. Uh, some beekeepers don't want their hives to be mapped, uh, you know, and publicly available. Uh, you know, so that's fine. They're not going to be on the map, but uh, for everybody else who sees a benefit to this system, uh, you know, they'll be included. Uh, you can map their locations and, and, and see where these sites are. Uh, before we move on, it's also important to note that this is not a regulatory tool, although it's being kind of managed and funded by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we're not using this for uh, enforcement actions really, you know, we're not monitoring acreage size of nurseries and, and, and things like that. And, you know, whether beekeepers are, are registered, it's, uh, something that we're providing, but it's really a service, uh, a tool for the users, the public to use, and we're just kind of maintaining it. And that being said, there's no special legal protections associated with using this program because it is voluntary, you know, applicators are still responsible for following all the rules. Uh, you know, with doing the applications, uh, producers are still responsible for, um, you know, communicating where they are and, 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 you know, any damages that might occur. This use of this tool doesn't exempt anybody from, uh, you know, liability issues. Uh, so that being said, uh, you know, why, why, why do we even need a registry like this? Uh, well, for the past few years, and I'm sure you've heard about the new dicamba uh, herbicide products, uh, some of the new 2,4-D uh, dual products uh, that have been coming online recently. Uh, we knew that these products were on the horizon. They're here now. Um, but years ago, you know, when we saw this coming, there were a lot of concern amongst uh, grape growers, tomato growers in particular, about the volatility of these products. Um, some of these new products would change the traditional timing of applications and maybe their, their fruits would be more susceptible while they're in bloom to these herbicides that are being used. Some of these have traditionally been very volatile formulas of the products 
And so there was a lot of concern about, uh, you know, there'd be a lot of increase in, in damage uh, from the use of these uh, new products. And so there was thought that having this uh, communications tool like this would help uh, calm some nerves, first of all, you know, it would kind of show that applicators are doing everything they can to mitigate the risk. Uh, it would help the producers know that, you know, there is communication going on, people are aware of what's going on, they're trying to, to do their best. And so it would give a little bit more leeway, you know, operational freedom, uh, we like to say, uh, for the pesticide applicators to be able to use the products that they need to control a lot of these new resistant weeds. Um, and at the same time help, you know, assuage some of those fears that uh, specialty crop producers have and, you know, justifiably have. Uh, so a little bit more about uh, the potential risk. Uh, there was some research done by uh, Cindy and some folks at Extension uh, that, you know, suggests that most of the, you know, ag-related pesticide damage is not reported to us at ODA. Um, I think that's, uh, you know, pretty true. I think you know, only a few cases are, are you know, reported to us. Most people don't want to get the state involved. I think they rather handle it themselves or they're not too worried about it. Um, but the situation is a little bit different when you're dealing with specialty crop growers. You know, uh, grain crops are typically uh, lower in value per acre uh, than specialty crops, fruits and vegetables, for example. And a lot of these vineyards, for example, or certified organic locations, um, you know, it really takes several years of growing those types of crops before they start to uh, produce fruit. Or for certified organic, they need to be, you know, pesticide free for a minimum of three years. Uh, you know, so there's a long period of time that factors into the cost. If there is pesticide damage, you know, if you kill a, 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 a grapevine, it's going to take several years to regain the production of that vine, or, you know, the vineyard. Uh, so the potential, you know, compensation and, you know, damages costs can really add up quite quickly. And that may not be something that a lot of traditional, you know, grain commodity growers are, you know, familiar with or aware of. Um, so, you know, it can really put uh, some folks out of business, which is why they're concerned about the, the use of some of these products. Um, apart from the financial risk, you know, potentially being liable for any damages that, that occur, you know, there are some legal obligations that pesticide applicators have uh, and that this registry tool can help them with. Uh, for example, in Ohio, we have this regulation uh, about notification of beekeepers. So if you're a pesticide applicator and you're using a product that is labeled as being toxic to bees, and if you meet all these other uh, conditions, if your application area is in bloom, and if you're within a half mile of the apiary, um, then you need to you know, notify the beekeeper a day in advance before making the application. Um, you know, and that, it, that is a, a legal requirement. Obviously, there's a lot of pretty specific conditions here that you need to meet. Most people don't meet all of these, but some people do. And in those situations, they are required to, to notify the beekeeper in advance. And, uh, you know, some folks, they aren't required to do it legally, but they would like to do it, you know, being a good neighbor. Or maybe they have, have had some problems in the past, so they would like to just do a notification anyway, uh, regardless of the, you know, legal requirement of it. And that's a good application area for this mapping program because traditionally what you would need to do is, the thing is a lot of beekeepers, uh, hobbyists anyway, hide their beehives. Some folks are very um, worried about vandalism, about bee theft, uh, complaints from neighbors, et cetera. So a lot of people kind of hide their hives away which obviously makes it difficult for pesticide applicators to know that there's a hive nearby that they need to be worried about, you know, and, and notify the beekeeper about it. Um, so having this mapping system helps locate where those hives are. Traditionally, an applicator would have to call into our office and request uh, a list of the registered beekeepers in the particular area, you know, in a county, and get a list of addresses and try to figure out where these are in relation to their application area. And it's really not uh, the best setup for that. 
Um, but having this mapping program, obviously, you can very easily see where these sites are and uh, you know, notify beekeepers if, if you fall into, those, uh, into this category of the notification requirement. Um, I've been talking mostly about agricultural pesticides, but this uh, system is useful for other types of pesticide applicators as well. Um, mosquito and vector uh, control, uh, industrial vegetation along right of ways, uh, things like that. Anybody who would be dealing with either urban beekeepers, you know, or agricultural um, production out in the country. Another uh, legal obligation that the system can help with, this is an example from, I believe it's the Extendamax, you know, so the Extendamax label, which is uh, the Canva herbicide product. Um, one of the requirements, which is a legal requirement, is that the applicator must survey the site before spraying for uh, non-target susceptible crops, um, which for Extendamax is um, pretty much every other crop that's not their beans. Um, there's also commonly in some of these products a statement about they must consult applicable sensitive crop registries to identify um, where these locations are. Uh, so that language is in a few of the new products. It will, will probably become more and more common as products become more common and available. Um, so, you know, there's I said before, nobody is really required to use the system. It's a voluntary system, you know, from our perspective. Uh, but according to the label, depending on the language that they use, um, it may be required to check the crop registry depending on, you know, the product that you're using and the language that's on the product. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well, depending on, uh, you know, the, the pesticide product that you're using. Uh, that being said, you know, the crop registry, using the crop registry map is not a complete substitute for scouting, you know, for uh, surveys before doing the application. As I mentioned, it's a voluntary system, so not everybody is going to be on the map. You know, there'll be organic folks who are not on the map, beekeepers, a lot of beekeepers who are not on the map. And, uh, you know, so it's not a complete substitute. It can obviously help take a lot of the time and, and work away from, from doing a lot of intensive surveys, but uh, you still need to be aware of what's on the ground, whether it's on the map or not. You know, at the end of the day, it's something to keep in mind. Uh, so Dicamba was pretty big uh, news this year. In the past year, it hasn't been terrible here in Ohio. Uh, people who file official complaints about pesticide misuse, suspected misuse, and and uh, other types of complaints like that contact our office and we do investigations and follow-ups um, as necessary. This past year, uh, these numbers might have changed a little bit, but uh, we had about 116 agricultural related uh, pesticide complaints, uh, drift, uh, that kind of thing. And that's pretty typical. Uh, the numbers are right around uh, this range year to year. We didn't really see a big spike in, in complaints this year. Um, as you can see, most of the complaints that we did get were drift related. Um, a few bee kill complaints, uh, aerial application related complaints, uh, some misuse of you know, pesticide labels and things. Um, but the majority of the complaints that we did receive were, were drift related. And that did have to do somewhat with uh, the use of dicamba. Uh, so we had about 52 dicamba complaints. Again, this number may change a little bit, but uh, we had about 50 dicamba complaints this year, which compared to the other states is uh, pretty great, uh, you know, in terms of not having a lot of them. Um, that being said, I don't think it's being used a whole lot here in Ohio at this point. Uh, you know, I'm sure it'll be used a lot more in the coming years. Um, but for Ohio, anyway, it really wasn't too bad of a year in terms of uh, dicamba issues. Uh, so part of the you know, risk reduction has to do with education and training, knowing how to use these pesticides. Dicamba, obviously, is a, a hot button issue. There's special training for the, the dicamba products that you have to go through. 
a lot of special restrictions and record keeping requirements to use the dicamba product correctly. And another part of the risk reduction is through awareness, uh, knowing where these sensitive locations are, how far they are away from your application area, uh, so that you can take the appropriate measures, you know, buffer distances, staying away from these areas, monitoring the downwind direction, uh, wind speed, uh, to make sure that, you know, try to reduce as much as possible the risk of the pesticide either being moved by wind or volatilizing and, and moving off target. And again, you know, it's not just the, the actual risk of the damage, it's also, you know, the financial and legal risk we're trying to reduce and improve public perception and, you know, acceptance of, of these technologies that, you know, for weed management is really pretty critical at this point, given all the resistant weeds that we have here in Ohio and across the country. Um, so I'll give a demonstration of the, the product uh, in a little bit, but right now, I did mention we started this program. We had a version of the registry program that we started back in 2014. That was a program that we developed here at ODA. Uh, we owned it, we maintained it, and we had about 1,700 users by the end of the, uh, the program period, about four years later, uh, people who were signed up and using the program. And then this past March 2018, we decided to join uh, the Field Watch organization and use the registry programs that they offer, uh, which are used in a lot of other places, a lot of other states uh, across the country. Field Watch is the uh, name of the company, and the products that they offer are called Drift Watch and, and Bee Check. So you may have heard uh, Field Watch, Drift Watch, Ohio Sensitive Crop Registry. It's a lot of different names for the same thing, really. Uh, this crop registry and bee registry system, mapping system that we have here in Ohio. It was originally developed back in 2008 by Purdue for use in Indiana only. Um, and like I said, with the, these new pesticide products coming on the horizon, people were aware that this would be a pretty useful tool. So it kind of spread out from Indiana. It spun off into this nonprofit company, Fieldwatch, which maintains and, and updates the Drift Watch registry in, in the BCheck uh, apiary registry. Uh, this is a, a nonprofit organization, and most of their funding comes from the state departments of agriculture. Uh, each of the states who participates in the program pays them an annual fee. They have uh, corporate sponsors who donate and uh, have input into the development and uh, kind of steering of the of the product. And as I said, they have two main uh, branch, you know, programs: Drift Watch for crop producers and a program called Bee Check uh, for beekeepers. At the end of the day, it all goes to the same map that you'll see in a second here, but uh, they just have slightly different tools and different target audiences. Uh, so this is a map of the the states that are participating with Field Watch who have access to Field Watch. Uh, Ohio and Virginia and a few other states, uh, Maryland, I think, just joined in 2018. Uh, Indiana was obviously the, the founding state, but we have a majority of the uh, you know, agricultural states in the Midwest, anyway, uh, who are using uh, the field watch system. And that's a real benefit because not only is there you know, increased brand recognition, uh, you know, people are familiar with the name or they've at least heard of the name, um, they also have access to any of the other states. So if you're a pesticide applicator in Ohio, um, using the system will allow you to have access to the maps in Indiana, the maps in Michigan, um, Illinois. So you don't need to access different programs, different maps. It's all a one-stop shop to, to get the information that you need if you're working in multiple states. Um, in my role here in Ohio as the, the data steward is I verify the information of the locations that are coming into the system, do some quality control, make sure we don't get a bunch of uh, junk data into the, into the program. And I also act as a point of contact uh, for Ohio users. So folks can contact me if they have questions or need help using the system. They can also contact Fieldwatch. They have their own customer service folks. Uh, and tech support, so 
field watch reps and, and myself are, are the points of contact here in Ohio uh, for, for more information about this program or, or assistance using it. Um, I mentioned that there are different, you know, it's a very uh, stable kind of company, you know, it's been around for, for 10 years now and the funding sources are, are pretty stable. They get most of their funding from, from the states who pay into it. And they have a lot of uh, Monsanto and a lot of the uh, manufacturers of pesticide products are contributing to the project. They have a lot of co-ops, uh, CPS, for example, uh, tomato growers, um, red gold tomatoes is a big contributor. Uh, so it's a pretty stable, you know, in terms of funding, it's not a program that's just going to, you know, dry up and, and go away after you get on board. You know, it, it's going to be around and, and keep it continue to, to expand um, in the coming years. Um, in terms of that, the uh, it's a little uh, nitty gritty stuff, but uh, the, since it's a nonprofit, they have a board of directors and really the direction that the product goes in is determined by the board of directors. And they have a, uh, the point of this slide is they have a representative uh, sample from across the industry. They have uh, folks from Monsanto and Dow uh, manufacturers. They have uh, applicator companies involved uh, on the board. They have producers like Red Gold I mentioned before and they have folks from uh, you know, research and uh, university uh, people who put, who put input into this tool. And so the goal of that is to make sure that everybody is being represented and that it stays useful. And uh, you know, if producers need a certain feature added to the system, then they can voice their concerns and get that pushed in. Um, you know, if the applicators need something to make it more useful for them, for their new Dicamba products or, or whatnot. Um, so there's a lot of different perspectives involved in the development and kind of steerage of, of the program, and that just helps it stay uh, relevant and useful to, to the general public. So the way that the program works is it is uh, for commercial agricultural producers. Uh, there's a lot of different types of sensitive locations, pesticide sensitive locations. Uh, you know, threatened and endangered species, uh, you know, protected waterways, playgrounds, you know, a lot of places that are, you know, you could consider to be, you know, sensitive or susceptible to, to pesticide damage. Uh, but this map, you know, the program is not for those types of areas. Uh, it's really just for highlighting where high risk agricultural areas are. Uh, so people will not be having their, you know, their yards and their landscaping on the map uh, that they don't want sprayed. Uh, you know, private gardeners will not have their gardens on the map, you know, that they're worried about. Um, it's all for commercial agriculture and to try to help uh, prevent, you know, the private use of the system. There's an acreage size. It's kind of arbitrary, but it's just kind of a, a line in the sand to help determine who's you know commercial and who's who's private and we approve these sites on a case-by-case -case basis so if somebody has a small greenhouse you know obviously a greenhouse is probably not half an acre in size uh, but uh, you know they have a greenhouse that's probably commercial we'll go ahead and approve that uh, so it gets on the system and as far as commercial goes uh, for beekeepers that's not completely uh, you, you know, correct. It's both hobbyist and commercial beekeepers. So for producers, crop producers, it's for commercial only, but for beekeepers, both hobbyist and commercial are included. And that's particularly important for Ohio because most of our beekeepers in Ohio are hobbyists. They have uh, very few um, hives or colonies uh, per aviary. So you don't need to be a commercial beekeeper in order to, to use the system. So I mentioned it's for commercial crop producers and more specifically, it's for specialty crop producers. Uh, this pretty, pretty much anything other than grain commodities, uh, fruit and vegetables, such as grapes, nurseries are included, uh, hops. There's a lot of hops locations that have been added to the map recently, uh, greenhouses, orchards, you know, nut trees, you know, you know, tree farms and things. Those are all included. Those are all considered to be specialty crops. Uh, they're high value 
high risk, uh, and so they are included. Um, we do have an exception for organic crops. If you're growing organic soybean, then you are eligible to be on the map. So organic grains will be on the map, but conventional, you know, dicamba beans uh, will not be on the map. That's just kind of a, a, a rule that the board of directors decided on uh, where they want to focus the, the, the program. Um, I don't have it listed here, but um, traditionally, you know, in years previous, we also did not include, um, you know, the non-tolerant uh, beans. You know, so I mentioned dicamba, dicamba cotton, dicamba soybeans. Um, you know, uh, if somebody was growing Liberty Link beans, they might be susceptible to the, you know, dicamba herbicides that are being sprayed. Well, that product, you know, the, the crop is susceptible, so why can't we put it on the registry? Um, well, everything, you know, the argument traditionally has been, you know, everything's susceptible to something, uh, depending on the timing and, and, and the product that's being used. So uh, not worrying about GMOs and, and, you know, the types of varieties of beans that are being planted, there is just a kind of a blanket statement, we're not going to accept grain crops, essentially. Uh, that changed a little bit this past year. They had a pilot program in Arkansas uh, where they allowed grow crops to be mapped on a you know, kind of a separate system. So we have a system for specialty crops and a system for, uh, for row crops, non-tolerant uh, row crops. And that was a pilot program that was used only in Arkansas. Um, and apparently it was uh, considered a success, success there. Um, and so they're going to start to roll it out to other states as an option if states want to allow you know, uh, non-tolerant bean and corn producers uh, to register under this new system called CropCheck that will be available to them. Um, however, we're not going to be using that system in Ohio uh, for 2019, we may in the future, uh, but for this next year, uh, these current rules that are on the slide um, stand. It's just for specialty crops, uh, you know, non-tolerant crops, you know, non-GMOs, things like that are still excluded in Ohio at this point. Um, this is, I'll give a demonstration in a moment here, but this is the basic viewer uh, of the map. You log into the website and each crop uh, location has a little marker. When you zoom in, you can see the outline of the field. It's a pretty simple interface. It's not too complicated, uh, as we'll see in a moment. When you click on one of those pins or, or the field that's been highlighted, you get a little pop-up window with contact information of who's responsible for that field or the, the beehive, uh, their location information, and any contact information uh, that, that they provide is available to the applicators. Um, so again, this is a service really that we're providing. We're not really using it ourselves here at the departments. We're maintaining it for, for the stakeholders to, to use themselves. Uh, the users have access to the website at any time during the year, you know, whether it's the growing season or not, they can log in, they can add sites, they can remove sites, edit sites as they need to. If they're rotating crops to different fields, uh, they can maintain all that stuff themselves and keep it you know, updated in, in, in real time. As part of that, uh, there is an annual renewal process to make sure that information stays current. Uh, you know, so your fields will expire and not show up on the map at the end of the year, uh, December 31st, I think. And so after that point, it will not show up on the map. You'll have to log into the system again and renew the site in order for it to appear back on the site. And that's just to avoid you know, old abandoned uh, data from uh, clogging up the system. I'm not sure if I emphasize this enough, but the system is uh, free. It's a program that the state pays for and some companies pay for, um, but to add locations to the map, to search the map, it is free for everybody in Ohio to use. Um, create a free account and you can log in, you can check all the crop sites, all the beehives. Uh, you can get email notifications sent to you uh, if you're an applicator. It doesn't cost anything to add locations to it. 
um, or to check it. That being said, there are some advanced features that some people might be interested in, uh, some businesses might be interested in, and those advanced features do require a, uh, a membership fee, and that essentially just lets you either download the data, the location data, if you want to plug it into your own computer system, um, or you can live stream the data if you have an internet connection to your equipment. Uh, so if you're driving around and, and navigating in, in your sprayer equipment, you can see on the on your navigator uh, where these sites are. And that, that part does require uh, a membership fee, as I said, but basic users, you know, most people, uh, the, the free account is uh, more than enough for what they need. Uh, so last month, we had about 900 users uh, here in Ohio, roughly the same 300 uh, for both uh, you know, applicators, beekeepers, and producers here in Ohio. And we kind of started fresh in March when we switched over to this new system, so everybody had to sign up again, if, even if they had been using the previous system. And we usually get a spike in enrollment during the winter months when people are uh, you know, not working out in the fields. So we expect these numbers to, to climb, especially as we continue to do outreach um, in, the, in the coming months, you know, winter and, and early spring. Uh, this is about average to the other states that are using the system. Uh, some states have more requirements. They might require their beekeepers to use it. So obviously those numbers will be much higher for those states. In terms of the types of crops we have, um, the most in terms of acreage are uh, certified organic farms. They were pretty quick to jump on this when it became available. Uh, just kind of a generic vegetables category is pretty high. Um, also tomatoes, I think we usually have about eight or 9,000 acres of tomatoes in Ohio, approximately. Uh, so that's a little bit lower than the maximum that we've got. We have about nine hops fields. As I mentioned, hops is you know, becoming more popular and uh, those locations will be added to the, to the registry moving forward, I'm sure. Uh, so this is a quick, well not quick, but it is a, a video demonstration of how to use the, the crop registry system. Uh, so everything's done online. Uh, you would go to fieldwatch.com as the, the website. There's also a mobile app that you can download and use. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but you basically, you go to Fieldwatch the website and they have three different programs here. They have a program called Driftwatch, a program called BeeCheck, and a program called Fieldwatch, which is kind of confusing because it's also the name of the company. Um, but they all ultimately go to the same map, but there's slightly different you know, tool set that's available depending on what your need is. So if you're a pesticide applicator, you would click on that pesticide, you know, the, the field watch for applicators map. And you can sign in here on the right if you already have an account. For Ohio, you need to have an account. There's no anonymous access. Some states are different, but in Ohio, you have to have an account. So on the left-hand side, you can create the account or start the process to create the account. You would select the state that you're working in. In this case, it's Ohio. You can select any of the other member states that are available. But if you're, you know, want to see Ohio sites, you can pick Ohio. Pick your own username, pick your own email, pick your own password. It's a pretty simple password. It doesn't need to be real complicated, just eight characters or so um, to, to set up your account. And then you provide a little bit more contact information, your name, there's some optional fields here for your organization if you're you know, a business, uh, your website, uh, your address information, city, state, zip code, nothing uh, unusual there. Phone number uh, is required. Uh, it won't let you proceed if you don't put in your phone number. Uh, this active state should already be selected from you know, your previous one in Ohio, but you can change that here if you need to. And for pesticide applicators, there's another box down here, uh, pesticide applicator license number. If you're a licensed applicator, uh, you can put that in here. It is an optional field, but we encourage you to, to put that in there just for record keeping. Uh, there's a license you know, agreement, terms and conditions you agree to. And this is one of the nice things about 
uh, the Driftwatch program is pesticide applicators can sign up for email alerts. So you don't need to be constantly checking to see if anything new has been added to your area. You can select uh, any or all counties uh, here in Ohio, assuming Ohio is your operating state. You can also choose the entire state if you want to get notifications anytime anything's been added. Or you can even draw a custom region. So if there's a particular you know, sub-county or some strange area that you're working in, you don't want to get emails for the entire county, then you can specify a, a custom area to receive email notifications about. And it's a pretty simple interface. You zoom in, you know, navigate to the area that you want to get notifications for. And there's a uh, begin tracing button you click on. Then you simply click around the map to draw your area. And, and that's all that is. And of course, if you don't want uh, email notifications at all, you don't have to sign up for it. It's an optional, uh, you know, if you don't get flooded with, with emails, you can choose not to do that. But it is useful for, for certain folks. Uh, so this is the, uh, the, the map for Ohio. Now, obviously there's nothing on here right now, uh, but it's a pretty simple interface, zoom buttons. Uh, you can switch between satellite and street map. You know, it uses Google Maps, so most folks will be familiar with that or, you know, Bing Maps or anything. Um, there's also a button here that will go to my location, so you can kind of auto-navigate to your current location. If you're using your phone, it will use your phone's GPS uh, to go to your location. Otherwise, it will approximate your location based on your, you know, your computer's uh, network location. So it'll automatically find, you know, about where you are and help you. So you don't have to search around the whole state uh, for your application area. There's also the search function. You know, it's a very basic uh, search. It's like anything else. You can search for the entire state of Ohio, counties, cities, uh, zip codes. You know, it's just a standard search tool to help you find the, your, your application area, your target area to see if anything is, is nearby. This is pre-recorded, so I may have to wait a little bit to, for the video to catch up. Uh, you may see, it may be hard for you guys to see, but there are uh, some pink areas here uh, on the map, and those are the uh, locations that we'll get a better view of here in a second. Now, the reason why nothing's showing up on the map here is because we have this check mark show sites in my area only. So this is only showing locations that were in that custom region that I drew, you know, a moment ago. Um, so it's filtering based on that. And if I turn that off, then I'll see everything, everything in Ohio. As you can see, it's pretty clustered. Uh, it's not really useful at that scale. Uh, but once you zoom in, you can see that each crop uh, has its own color pin. Um, they have different names or initials on it. This is a certified organic location here. Uh, some tomato, uh, you know, for tea for tomato there, some beehives, lots of beehives uh, in this area. There's also some other filters. Uh, you can filter based on the way it's grown. If it's an organic, you're only interested in organic crops, you can toggle that on and off. Uh, or if you're only interested in conventional, you're not worried about organic, you can filter those. You can also filter based on crop type. So if you're only interested in beehives and don't want to look at grapes, or if you only want to look at grapes, you can target those just you know, basic filters to help you uh, find the locations. So this is a vineyard that somebody's entered in uh, to the system. Here's the, the vineyards there. I don't know if you can see the rows, um, but there's the G pen there for grapes and the red outline of their field. And uh, when you click on that, it will give you the contact information for this person, uh, the location information in terms of coordinates, and you know, when it was submitted, and as I said, their email and phone number uh, that applicators can have access to if they need to contact this person uh, for some reason before or after uh, their application. 
There's also a link where you can report a problem if something gets past me, something that shouldn't be on here and you think that there's a problem with it. Um, you can click on that and we'll send a, a message to me saying, hey, there's something wrong here. You should look into this and see if it really should be on the map or, or if it just looks strange or something. There's some kind of problem with it. Um, I'm the point of contact for Ohio, so pretty much all the messages and alerts and things come, come to me directly. Um, and I'll resolve those as they come in. Now for, that was an example of a vineyard for great, or for bees rather, it's a little bit different. You can see that the bees have this uh, fairly large circle uh, around the beehives. Um, it's the same information as with the vineyards, contact information, location information, et cetera. Um, the big difference here is that there's an automatic buffer area put around beehives. So the actual bee, you know, the, the boxes will be, you know, at the center of the circle. But what this distance is, is what we call the state apiary distance. You can toggle that on and off if you don't want to bother looking at the big circle. But this is a half mile radius. Um, and the reason why we have this half mile radius here is because of that regulation I mentioned uh, half an hour ago about notifying beekeepers within a half mile if you meet those other criteria. So this is just an easy way to see whether your target area is within a half mile distance of a particular aviary. Um, you know, if you're spraying out here, you don't need to worry about this guy, whether you're using a toxic product or not because you're outside of the half mile buffer zone. Um, again, not all beekeepers will be registered on the map, um, but uh, you know, obviously the people who are signed up to use it are, are concerned about pesticide drift. Everything is, uh, you know, available by the user. You can change your profile, uh, your contact information, email address. You can change your password at any time. It's all available to you. You can do that yourself. You can change your alerts at any time you want to. If you want to unsubscribe or resubscribe, if you want to change your area that you want to get results, uh, you know, alerts about, you can do that. Those are all on the upper right hand side of the screen after you log in. You can change these options here um, at any time. And as I mentioned before, being a member of this organization, you can view the locations of other states. So if you're a pesticide applicator in Ohio and you also do some work in Indiana, you can switch to the Indiana map as I just did in the video and see uh, where the sites are in Indiana or for any other member state for that matter. And the reason why nothing's showing up now is because we had this show only in my area. If we turn that off and you can see uh, all the states, you know, for uh, that are in Indiana. Now they've been running for 10 years, so they have a little bit of a head start on us. Um, but, uh, you know, the point is you can see their, their fields, anything that Indiana or any other state um, has put on, you have access to those as well. So it really helps with, you know, those folks who are working in multiple areas. They don't have to sign up and switch to you know, different registry programs. Uh, it's a lot easier for them to, to work. Uh, so that's pretty much it for the uh, applicator side of the program. It's a very simple viewer, essentially. Um, if you're a, a paying member, you know, there's the download, you can select and download sites if you want a copy of the data for your own, you know, software, computer, but the, you know, the free version that pretty much everybody else uses is, is, is that. Um, go to the website and you can access those. Now, just in case there's any producers uh, watching, I'll do a quick demo on the producer side. Um, there's a separate interface, so you'll need to create a separate account if you're a producer. Um, to get access to the producer tools. And it's very similar uh, setup. You click on the Drift Watch for Producers button that I just did and make sure Ohio is your active state. Give yourself a username and email. It can be the same email address. You don't need to have multiple email addresses. Uh, I believe the username needs to be different. Uh, then your contact information, same as before. The only thing that's different here is that obviously there's no, it's not gonna ask you for the pesticide applicator license number. So we're assuming you're a producer and not an applicator.
So that's all you need to do to create the account. And as soon as you do that, you can start registering sites. There's no delay in doing that. Uh, you can get started right away. And all you have to do is click this blue button that says register a site. And when you do that, it will open up this little menu. There's a three page menu that we'll go through uh, to add crop locations to the map. Uh, now that being said, there is a similar system for beekeepers. It is uh, slightly different as we'll see, um, but if you register as a producer, you are primarily adding uh, fields, but it will allow you to add bee locations as well. You don't have to have a separate account to do both produce and in bees. Um, it's a little bit different, but there's that changeover. If you register as a beekeeper, you can also do crops. If you register as a crop producer, you can also do bees. So really the only time you need to have two separate accounts is if you're a producer and a, an applicator, you need to have those two types of, of accounts. Um, so the crop year will default to the current year. In this case, it's 2019 for the upcoming year. Um, Ohio should be automatically selected based on your profile. And then you select the type of crop that you're growing. It's not a huge deal. Um, you know, the type of crop you select, uh, you know, there's a general fruit category, a general vegetable category. If you want to separate everything out into individual fields, you can. If you want to combine them all into a single field, that's fine too. You can specify whether they're organic or not. If you say they're certified organic, you need to provide the ID number of your certification as proof. Otherwise, you can just say you're just generally organic or conventional. Uh, conventionally grown. And you can also pick the dates that your site will be active. So they'll automatically expire at the end of the year, December 31st. Um, but if you want to have a different time, you can specify that there as well. You can give the field a name. Um, as we'll see, it kind of randomly generates one. Otherwise, if you have a lot of fields, it can be difficult to tell which one is which. So giving it some kind of nickname or, or you know, some other name is, is useful when you go back into do editing and renewals. So I'll put in comments, I'll see these on the state data steward. So if you have a note for me, um, something that might be questionable, you can put the note in there and I'll check it out before I approve it. So you go on to the next page and now finally it will ask you to, you know, move the map to your area where your, your, your fields are. So I uh, centered the map using my current location and we'll just move over here to the Department of Agriculture. And I'll add this field south of the department uh, to the map. And to do that, it's similar to the alert drawing. You click on this blue begin tracing button and you simply click around the corners of your field. There's a line that will follow your cursor around. So you just need to outline it and uh, connect the dots to finish drawing. It's fairly straightforward. I haven't had uh, too many complaints or questions about how to do this. Um, but if there are questions, you know, people can call me if they're having a lot of issues doing it, I can do it for them. Um, but, you know, ideally everybody will be taking care of their own data and keeping it up to date as needed. And you can change the shape, and, you know, move the corners around as you need to, to make sure you get the, the right area. It doesn't need to be survey grade. Uh, accurate, but as long as it's not including a lot of extra stuff that's not yours, uh, it'll be okay. Then you're done drawing, click the blue submit button. That sends an email to me, letting me know that this needs to be reviewed and approved or rejected. Um, you can click on it, see your contact information. The fields that you create will be entered in this list on the left-hand side. There'll be a list here. You can come into this and edit this at any time during the year. If you need to make changes, you can click on that green make changes button. You can change the shape, you can change the crop type. And if you want to delete it completely, there's a remove the site button uh, that will delete it from the system. So you have access to this and change it as you need to, to make sure things stay current. Uh, so that's really all you need to do from a crop producer standpoint. It's a pretty straightforward, uh, very user friendly system for adding locations onto the map. Uh, now I mentioned you're able to do beekeeper you know, responsibilities. You know you can add beehives um, 
to the map as well as doing crops. You don't need to have a separate account for that. In order to do beehives, you go back, collect some at a new site, everything's the same, except under crop type, you would select uh, beehives instead of an actual crop. Um, I know bees aren't technically a crop, but we'll let that slide. Um, so you'll select beehives there. You can select the purpose of the bees, whether they're commercial or whether they're hobbyist. That's just some miscellaneous info. The number of hives you have at that site, whether it's permanent or whether you're going to move it around. Some commercial apiaries, you know, they'll do contract pollinating and move their hives around. Um, most hobbyists, you know, they'll, they'll be permanent and stay in the single location of property. Um, so you'll select apiaries permanent for the season there. And there's a spot for your registration ID number. Now, apiaries are required to be registered with the department's apiary program. Everyone in Ohio is supposed to be registered. And that's different from this registration. You know, this is voluntary. The map is voluntary. But um, registration in the apiary program, a separate list is, is required for beekeepers. And so they'll generate an ID number for you. Uh, when you register with that program. So then you go back to your map and it's a lot simpler than the crops. Instead of drawing a shape, you simply click this blue place hives button and you put a dot on the field where your boxes are. If you're on your phone, we'll use your phone's GPS to place the dot, um, but you can manually just put it down. And it generates a small, I think it's a half acre circle that's the minimum crop size and you can move it around if it's not quite where it needs to be otherwise you place it click submit hives again that sends a notification to me i'll review it i'll approve it and then once it's approved it'll show up on the map uh, for the applicators to find and as you can see it's been added to the list here you can have as many as you want there's no limit to this list and if you do not give it a nickname it kind of gives it this generic ohio id number um, which is why it's kind of complicated if you have a lot of them. So we recommend giving them nicknames um, if you have a lot of fields to, to handle and, and sort through. Um, you can also add crops and beehives to other states. Um, you would simply change the map uh, to that state and that location's there. And I will send an email to that state's data steward to review. It's not going to go to me. Uh, so Hopefully that demonstration showed that it's a fairly straightforward and simple process to do. Uh, it's not terribly complicated, but we do have uh, user guides and, and contact information and resources available on the Driftwatch website uh, that people can access, how-to videos, step-by-step uh, -step guides if anybody is confused. Um, and of course, they can always contact myself or contact someone at Fieldwatch um, if they need assistance. Uh, producers and beekeepers do have access to these signs. ODA used to sell signs similar to these. Now that we're with Fieldwatch, we are no longer selling the signs. Um, but these signs can be purchased through Fieldwatch. You need to be a registered user. You can go to their website and, uh, and you'll purchase the signs through, through their website. This just kind of serves as a, a visual reminder, you know, out by your property line, uh, you know, that you have something sensitive uh, growing there nearby. Mentioned the main mode is through the website. You go to the website to do all this work, but they do have uh, some mobile applications available that they just recently launched, so you may not have heard about them yet, but they're for both Apple and Android um, products, tablets and, and phones, smartphones. Uh, you can download the app from the store, uh, sign in and do all of your work, check the fields, it will use your phone's GPS. Uh, you know, to, in your location to see if there's anything nearby. So if you're driving around in the field with your phone, you can, you can see if there's anything nearby kind of in real time, right? You have an internet connection. And uh, this is my contact information. My contact information is on the Fieldwatch website, as well as this slide. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the main point of contact. So my phone, my email, um, will all come to me, all these uh, alerts and questions about Fieldwatch will, will come to me for, um, uh, to respond to. And you can also get tech support and you know, business questions if 
your business and you do want to have access to some of those advanced features that you need to pay for, uh, all that stuff is done through FieldWatch. We don't, we don't do any of that here at the department. You know, membership fees and things are all done through the FieldWatch folks that you'll need to contact. Uh, so this is all on the FieldWatch website, uh, you know, if you don't want to write it down now. Um, but, uh, you know, somebody there, their, their customer service or, or us here at the department will, will be able to assist you with any questions or problems that may come up uh, using the system. Uh, so that being said, are there any questions here or online? Barb? Uh, so for each state is a little bit different. I believe that in Indiana, um, you do not have to have an account um, in order to see Indiana's locations. Um, but for Ohio, you will need to have an account. You'll need to sign up for an account to see Ohio's locations. Um, and after you do set up account, then you can see everything in Ohio, essentially. All right, anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. We'll turn it over to Cindy here for some closing words. Thank you, Jared. And so thank you everyone who was here and everyone who joined us online. Uh, just a reminder for the folks here, there's some evaluations we'd love for you to fill out. You can just leave at the registration table. For those of you online, um, when you leave us, there should be an evaluation that pops up that you'll be able to see. Um, if it does not, I'll be sending out an email to you afterwards that'll have the uh, link to the evaluation and you can fill it out at either time. We only need you to fill it out once. So thank you again for joining us. And um, this will be recorded and the recording will be available on the website that um, you got this link from, the go.osu.edu slash IPM. Thank you very much.